I've been asked to review the safety profiles of bispecific antibodies and how they can guide treatment choices. I will also present practical recommendations and guidelines for the management of frequent adverse events and have a special focus on long-term toxicities, including infection prophylaxis and management using a real clinical case. So because a lot of it has already been discussed in previous presentations, I wanna say one, I wanted to just give some special nuances that now happen when these drugs have become commercially available. And I also wanna preface that I will only be talking about the three commercially available BCM uh, targeted therapies or uh, bispecific antibodies, teclistamab, talketamab, and elranatinab. These are currently now indicated for patients with relapsed refractory myeloma who have had more than four prior lines of therapy that include a protozone inhibitor, an immunomodulatory agent, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. So let's talk first about teclistamab. Teclistamab, again, as you've already heard from Dr. Abuma, is targeting BCMA. Cytokine release syndrome, primarily grade one. And what is grade one cytokine release? It's basically a fever. Grade two, which is a fever, which may be some fluid response of hypotension, happens in one out of five patients. 33% of patients had greater in the grade two CRS events. And these, and one out of three patients required uh, tocilizumab, and those are patients who have greater than grade two. What's the first thing that we know about this is that one, these are side effects that are not routinely seen with the conventional chemotherapies patients get for multiple myeloma. So immediately our nursing staff and our ancillary staff need to be trained to be able to be aware of these complications, to be able to identify them and to be able to treat them effectively. And one of the big issues is that you need to make sure that when you start these treatments, you have tocilizumab available in the pharmacy. Both uh, teclistamab, talketamab, and elranatamab have what we would call risk mitigation strategies that any provider that are going to prescribe them has to go through a relatively straightforward educational course to be able to make sure that we can deliver these very good treatments to our patients in a safe manner. Remember, these treatments were first developed in myeloma centers in which there's a lot of experience with ICANs and neurotoxicity and CRS because they, do, they, they help develop these drugs and they help develop CAR T cells. Now that they go into the real world setting, many of our colleagues and providers have never had experience. So they have to first go and get educated. And I think there's nothing, we are all here available. If you have any questions about delivering these drugs, all of us on this call are more than happy to be able to assist you in caring of your patients. Neurotoxic events, the most common ones, these are very, this is not the neurotoxicity we commonly see with the CAR T cells, primarily headaches. Sometimes there is a little bit of confusions. Important to identify early, ICANS needs to be treated with steroids. The most common complications are actually cytopenias, neutropenia happening in 70% of the patients. Anemia and thrombocytopenia, remember these patients are heavily pretreated. Many of these patients come with extensive tumor burden. So these are not uncommon effects. They respond rapidly to either growth factor or, um, or transfusion support. In a patient in which neutropenia and cytopenias are not responding after their myeloma is responding, it is essential to get a bone marrow to see because some of these patients actually have an underlying mild dysplastic syndrome that needs to be identified. So what are the real world outcomes in patients who were ineligible? So these are patients who now would not have been eligible for teclistamab in the ongoing studies. So 45 heavily pretreated patients with multiple myeloma who were ineligible for majestic trial were studied. Of these, 84% would have been ineligible because of cytopenias, because of having received prior BCMA-directed therapy, not enough time for washout or poor performance status. Response rates were somewhat lower, 49% with 22% of patients achieving at least a VGPR. Prior anti-BCMA exposure was associated with an adverse overall response rate, 23% versus 61%. During step-up dosing, CRS and ICANS event of any grade were observed in 55% and 13% of patients, respectively. Patients at Emory were treated investigationally with prophylactic tocilizumab, and there was a decreased incidence and severity of CRS in heavily pretreated patients. This is similar to what you heard from Dr. Krishnan in the talketamab experience and when prophylactic tocilizumab seemed to reduce the risk of, of uh, CRS and ICANS 
in patients receiving the step-up dosing. The other thing important with these drugs, different to the other drugs that we have, is that there is this concept of step-up dosing. So patients receive first a very low dose of the drug to kind of get the worst response to them out of the way. And then they receive a higher dose and then the full dose at the third time. But all this has to be in an in, in, per label now, this has to be in an inpatient setting. So once again, important to have a staff of nurses and ancillary personnel who recognize these toxicities and then can respond rapidly. Now, when the drug became commercially available, the one thing that we've all noticed is that toxicities are very much related to tumor burden, which begs the question then is, can we impact the toxicities of these drugs by reducing tumor burden before we administer them? And how, I mean, remember in the trials, we were not allowed to administer cytotoxic chemotherapy prior to giving the uh, bispecific antibody. In practice, however, one asks the question, if we were to give a DCEP-like treatment, would we be able to reduce tumor burden and then use these drugs as consolidation with a less toxic manifestation? The other thing that's according to emerge in the real world is many of these patients have stem cells available. And I think it's essential that all of us who are providing care to myeloma patients in the community, ask them whether they still have stem cells available from a prior collection. Because have you seen cytopenias are a major uh, side effect. And many of this is because they have poor graft functions because of extensive prior treatment. And as Dr. Loniel and others have already shown, we can reset the hematologic system by boosting these patients with stem cells that had been collected during the initial presentation of their disease. So elranatinib is another bispecific BCMA uh, targeted therapy. Again, as we can see, this can be given weekly or every other week with very high response rates. Now, again, as we've seen with other BCMA-targeted therapies, the overall response rates was lower in patients who had had prior BCMA. Now, what are the side effects? Again, as with all the other bispecifics, cytopenia is a common side effect. And again, we can't compare across trials, but it seems like the degree of cytopenia is similar. CRS happening in around 57% of the patients, but no grade three or four. So these were primarily patients who had fever or volume responsive hypotension. Diarrhea, 40% of the patients. Fatigue is common across all these. Now, is it because these patients have very active disease or because they, or is it a side effect of the treatment? It's very difficult to dissect in these patients who are heavily pretreated. Uh, anorexia happened in 33% of the patients. And there's interesting, there were some, a, a single of hypokalemia. As with uh, the other BCMA-specific, ICANs occurred in four of them. It's, so this is not CAR T-cells. You're not getting the neurotoxicities that we see with CAR T-cells. What we primarily get is headaches and some mild degree of confusion. Um, all these patients were, uh, were heavily, you know, we, there, there were very few patients required steroids or tocilizumab, and there was only one patient who eventually required an anti-seizure prophylaxis. And no discontinuation was due to CRS or ICANN. So let's focus on um, our CR, the, the adverse events of special interest of CRS and ICANN. The reason why we do step up dosing is that because this significantly reduces the risk of serious CRS and ICANNs in all these bispecific agents. So as you can see with this, the median time to uh, resolution of all these symptoms really happens very quickly. But once again, because you have staff that is rapid, that's very well aware of these side effects and can rapidly institute treatment with tocilizumab and steroids. It'll be very interesting with the, with, when we start doing prospective trials of tocilizumab and steroids, whether we can effectively start giving these agents that outpatient and do not require an inpatient hospitalization but all of these drugs require step-up dosing. So it will be a very low dose as the first dose, an intermediate dose as the second dose 48 hours later, and then the full dose 48 hours later after the second dose. But whether that this time currently the label requires hospitalization, but there are prospective trials exploring the possibility of giving prophylactic steroids and tocilizumab to prevent hospitalization. This will have to be in selected patients, selected patients because they have their you know, functionally very active, 
they have good supportive care or good uh, caregiver support. And more importantly, probably they have low tumor burden at the time of instituting these types of treatment. GPRC5D is the other therapeutic target we're going to talk about. This is the, the target that is uh, the target of talketamab. And again, the important thing of GPRC is that it is expressed in normal tissues, particularly in skin cells that express hard keratin. So that's hair follicles, the filiform papilla of the tongue. And what this is is now, obviously you have an on target, but off tissue effect or off tumor effect that can result in dysgeusia and skin and nail toxicity. So the monumental trial enrolled patient with heavily pretreated refractory myeloma who had re progressed after a medium of six prior lines of therapy. And there was, they were given uh, talketamab uh, at the sub-Q either weekly, every other week or every month at doses ranging between five to 1600 micrograms per kilo. So patients receiving the recommended phase two dose uh, either, either at a weekly dose of 405 micrograms per kilo or at a every other week dosing of 800 micrograms per kilogram. Response rates were similar with both dosing schedules, overall response of 70% with the weekly schedule versus 64% with the every other week schedule, um, with a duration of response of 10 months versus 7.8 months, which was not statistically different. So I wanna just focus on what, the, uh, the, what we now recognize as probably a significant toxicity with these GPRC5 targeted agents, the nail related events and the taste related events. And the taste related events at the weekly doses so happened with 63% of the patients and at the every other week about 57%. Although they're described as no grade three or four toxicity, we have seen significant weight loss in these patients. So what happens is, and this happens very quickly after one or two doses, these patients start saying they basically lose their appetite, that things just simply don't taste well or don't taste at all. And it is essential to be able to give these drugs effectively as one, that we have to um, give adequate uh, nutrition and adequate nutritional support. And then the nail-related events, particularly the rashes, can be treated topically. And I think as um, Amrita discussed, probably the most effective way of being able to mitigate these toxicities is to extend the dosing schedule to every four weeks, especially in responding patients. So this is just an overview of safety data. As you can see, CRS is common across the board for all these drugs. Very few patients with grade three or four toxicity rapidly responding to either steroids or tocilizumab. Cytopenias are common and infection complications are common throughout them. So uh, what infectious complications are common throughout? Hypogammaglobulinemia is common. Should everybody get IVIG replacement? That is a big controversy in the field. Our current approach is that only patients who had a serious previous infection that was related to hypogammaglobulinemia or have recurrent sinopulmonary infection who have the IgG levels of less than 400 should be getting monthly IVIG replacement. Everybody should have a cyclovir prophylaxis for herpes virus. Everybody should be monitored for CD4 counts and in patients with low CD4 counts, PCP prophylaxis is a must. In patients with cytopenias, particularly patients with neutropenias, they should be getting neupogen. Patients should be assessed for risks of CHIP and MDS. So I just want to show you a case of, this is one of my patients, 56-year-old, who had had at least nine lines of treatment, including a second autologous transplant. She then came on for her uh, line number 10 was to clistamab and see how major response she's had. But during this period of time, she's had recurrent sinopulmonary infections that responded and have been reduced with IVIG replacement. She is currently on PCP prophylaxis and acyclovir prophylaxis and is now back to monthly teclistamab and has had a sustained MRD negative complete remission. So again, in summary, how do we manage delayed toxicities, hypogamma global anemia, IgG replacement for all patients who have IgG less than 400 milligrams, or only for patients with recurrent sinopulmonary infections or history of severe infection. This is across the country. There's different people. Some people do everybody who's hypogamic level anemic. Others, like in our group, we just do patients who have 
either a serious infection or history of recurrent sinopulmonary infection. Patients who have an infection, even an upper respiratory tract infection, by specific antibodies should be held until these are resolved. We need to remember every patient with fever needs to have a workup for opportunistic infections. This includes looking for rare viruses like it's CMV, HHV6, and EBV. All patients should have their CD4 counts monitored. And if it's below 200, then patients should get PCP prophylaxis. Everybody should have zoster and, uh, and herpes virus prophylaxis with acyclovir. Everybody should be educated on appropriate vaccination strategies. And in a patient who comes in with a fever, aggressive workup and therapy, including an ID consultation is warranted. So in summary, T-cell directed T-cell redirection therapy with bispecific antibodies or CAR-Ts have revolutionized the treatment of patients with refractory multiple myeloma. These treatments can be severely immune suppressive and have been associated with serious life-threatening complications. Acute complications such as CRS and ICANS respond well to TOSI and steroids, but require a well-aware and trained staff. Opportunistic infections need to be identified early with a high degree of awareness. Acyclovir and PCP prophylaxis should be standard of care. An IgG replacement should be considered for all patients with low IgG, recurrent sinopulmonary infections, and high risk of serious infections complications.